This show is taped at La Seine, a space for creation and collaboration. Artists, thinkers, and creators of all stripes tell us what inspires their work, a starting point that takes us into their creative process in their own words. Welcome to Who Inspires You. Glenn Le Mesurier is a sculptor. He works with steel parts that he finds in scrapyards. He builds large sculptures that are displayed in public spaces all over Montreal. For 25 years, his work has traveled throughout Canada, the United States, and Europe. His work is currently best viewed at the Twilight Sculpture Garden, a permanent attraction of 75 sculptures in the Myland. He recently had a collection of 22 sculptures on display at Parc Faubourg. And just this fall, he opened a 300-acre sculpture park on the Montreal-New York border in Saint-Bernard-de-la-Colle. Glenn, hello. Hi. Thanks for being with us. You're welcome. So let me just jump right in and ask you who or what inspires you? Um, well, there's a number of things that inspires one if you're making things. And in my case, I, I, I would probably think that um, it's other artists, of course. And along with that, it's poetry and music. So if, um, if we look at those three things and we compound them into one thing, what, when you see a piece of work that's finished, you can be sure that three or four of those influences are in there. So inspirationally, music is up there, poetry is up there, and um, other uh, iron workers mm -hmm. who make the who are like working along the same line of things that I do mm -hmm. are also in in the influences. Um, yeah, one of the iron workers that you or one of the sculptures that you mentioned um, is Bernard Lugenbiel, who's a Swiss sculptor, mm. um, and he is very influential in your work. Yes, um, I, a few years ago, um, well, it's longer than a few years ago, it was like uh, nine or ten years ago, actually, I received a, uh, um, a Council des Arts uh, grant in Quebec to travel around the, the world and um, look at artwork, uh, uh, specifically sculpture gardens um, of my choice. Um, so um, I was deeply influenced before by Expo 67, Okay. And two of the artists that were in Expo 67 uh, that were sculptors was uh, Bernhard Lugenbull, who is a uh, Swiss um, sculptor who makes uh, large pieces from machinery, and Jean Tangeli. Mm -hmm. uh, Tangeli and Nicky de Saint Paul had the uh, French pavilion, and Lugenbull had the Swiss pavilion. So I already had a place in my heart for these people. But to actually meet them yeah. and call them up and go and meet them, uh, Tangeli, no, because he was dead. And Nicky de St. Paul at the time was living in, um, in California. Uh, so um, I, I touched down with the family and <clears throat> I went over and uh, met them. Um, and Lugenbull actually has three sons who work alongside of him who uh, move a lot of the work and um, you know, and do a lot of the welding and things like this. So I was lucky enough to meet up with him. And um, because my work was so close to the uh, Swiss avant-garde from 19, you know, 1940 and 50 yeah. to uh, 2000, um, there was a uh, kinship between yeah. us and likenesses attract. And you can definitely see there's you know, a relationship between their work and yours in the, the way the sculptures are built. They have this kind of like almost animal-like um, quality to them. They, mm. they are very massive. They are always made of, of um, used pieces of steel from other machinery. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very humoristic too. Um, I tried, um, I, d I don't really know like what comes out of them once, once, they, um, once they are you know, they're finished, but which is very interesting because at times I'm surprised by um, uh, a form or a shape that will appear that yeah. I didn't actually catch in the uh, creative process yeah. in this thing. But um, I, I suspect with machinery and gears and uh, propellers and, um, 
you know, tubular, long tubular gongs or anything like mm -hmm. this, it's pr you're probably very limited in what you, um, in, in which way they be become expressive once they're out there in the world. Mind you, um, there, there are, you know, different uh, antidotes to everything when you build something. And in my case, because of the influences that I have from Lugambul and Tang Li, there are, um, my influences are probably more playful yeah. and more mechanical based mm -hmm. in, in the constructions. It is quite a challenge though, working with these steel parts. Your, your sculptures are, are big and they must be extremely heavy. Why, why did you even s decide to work with such a difficult material? Um, I think that, um, you know, um, I, I, I used to play music and in my, in my twenties and then, um, but I always wrote poetry and I knew these things would coagulate into something more powerful as I aged yeah. and got a little bit, um, you know, more connected to what really felt right for me. Mm. And I think that, um, you know, the, you know, I find steel is a very magnanimous material and our culture today is full of steel no matter where you look That's i mean right. everybody drives around in a car so we're talking like three thousand pounds right there right off yeah. the right off the top but um the lasting quality of steel and it's um in its weathering possibilities mm -hmm. for um a piece to remain uh on the planet and be visually um beautiful on some sort of level and to have that lasting quality is something I was shooting for. I, I used to, I started off making the shapes in wood and uh, there was a breakdown period with wood which would happen after three or four years but steel has a powerful lasting quality to it. Um, it's going to outlast you. Uh, yeah, I figure some of these pieces from what I can see depending on the, the, the type of steel it is and the way it's welded and put together, we're looking at probably between 150 to 200 years wow. of a breakdown. But the, the, the powerful thing about steel is, is that it's basically, um, it's basically the core of the earth mm. heated up mm -hmm. and changed into another form. Yeah. So when you go into the core of the earth and this stuff is mined and it's formed and put, rolled and heated and, yeah. and treated and acid can be applied to it and paint can be applied to it, to have the ability to take music and poetry from your mind and apply it to um, metal yeah. and give it a form and have it take a shape on the planet was what I mostly gravitated toward because mm. it felt right for me. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that once it's out there in the world and it's, um, you know, under the influence of the elements, does the sculpture change with time? You can, there are now processes to put on steel, which uh, there are lacquers and there are, um, you know, there are magnetic uh, paints that go on it where they, they positively charge the steel and negatively charge the paint and the two draw towards each other. There are all kinds of things now that you can mm -hmm. put on steel, but okay. the beautiful, the beautiful uh, part about it is that um, it's staying quality. It can stay for a long time. And in Switzerland and in California, the steel doesn't rust as fast as it does here. Mm -hmm. And I find that, um, you know, to, to take earth, actual earth that's compressed mm -hmm. and form it, and put it into the world and look at it and see it as a form and a, and a beautiful thing is, um, is something that, that is, um, it's really special. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're using these, these pieces that come from machinery from the industrial age, from the 20th century. Um, and does that, does that give any specific or special meaning to the work? Um, the fact that these pieces were used in the development of our society, basically? Well, that's a good question, Miriam, because um, sometimes when, you, when, you go, when I go into these, these cemeteries of broken down components from the last century, um, believe it or not, some of the pieces speak out to you <laughs> as you pass them. These powerful machines in gears and propellers and things had a life at one time mm -hmm. and they served a purpose. And they still do work. Yeah. Some of them still do work. And the, most steel workers that I know 
that work with the same components as me have told me the same thing that sometimes certain things will call out to you. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting, magical uh, ceremony that happens yeah. when you do this kind of thing because there is a rapport, yeah. a participation mystique that happens between the unconscious of the artist and the actual mm -hmm. material of the the shape or the material of yeah. the of the object that's been jettisoned into this yard. So um, as an artist, we are like in primitive times, magicians. Yeah. And what we do is we continuously take uh, something that has been uh, pushed away by society and we give it uh, a new form in a new life. And I think a beautiful example of this, I don't want to sidetrack too much, is um, recently I put a very large sculpture into a forest. Yeah. And um, this piece was a nice piece. It was 22, 23 feet. But when we had okay. put it into the forest, it was a large trajectory. I had the most powerful feeling of the forest from the trees and everything around uh, saying to me in a way what, like wh what is this thing here mm. what you've just <laughs> invaded a little bit of our space and we're not too sure about it but coming back a week later i had a feeling later of the forest you know welcoming it, it and and accepting it mm -hmm. as a member of its family because it is from the earth and we now know that trees do have a dna mm. and they can sense dna possibilities from uh, other things on the planet so there is some sort of um, you know, in a mercy, mercy iliadi mm -hmm. sense, um, a participation mystique with the form and the content of the object and the boreal forest. Yeah. Generally, people though, when they come in contact with public art, they are usually, you know, it's it's usually a positive reaction. I, I, that's part of the function of of public art is creating an emotion, uh, creating uh, hopefully a, a positive emotion in people who encounter it. Um, well, we wish, you know, <laughs> steel has no, what I've been trying to do, and this is why I make them semi-kinetic sometime, is steel is static. Yeah. And there are some writers that don't like, um, and some critics that don't like static pieces that okay. just stay there because of their forms are beautiful and they have a, a certain thing. I've been struggling, I mean, creatively and uh, philosophically within these pieces to speed them up. Mm -hmm. And this is what I learned from the Swiss was to get these pieces to move. It's really hard to move three or 4,000 pounds, you know, yeah. in, a, in a length of, or to get it to move um, <clears throat> suggestively from its shape. But getting a positive reaction from um, the world around you for these things um, is a kind of a throw in. And it's nice if you okay. can get it, because that is really what you're trying to do with art. You're trying to, um, you know, you're trying to get, um, some sort of um, resonance from society um, about the piece. Mm -hmm. And this is what was so beautiful about the um, Expo 67 World Exhibition, which had a ton of sculpture. Yeah. And um, these pieces were, were beautiful and they were powerfully placed in the city afterwards. Some of them left, but most of them stayed. What is the heritage of that um, Expo 67, uh, specifically the sculptures? Have they remained within Montreal? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> what they did with Expo was that they, they, they knew they had other countries coming, but and they knew they had a lot of really good sculptors here. So mm -hmm. what they did in 65 and 66 was they had two symposiums of uh, sculptures yeah. in Elma and one in Sheffer Shefferville to find out who they were going to use for Expo because uh -huh. these guys were working really huge and the pieces they were making were gigantic. Yeah. Um, Montreal has a very long history of cement, um, and stone makers and uh, wood makers and Armand Vaillancourt, of course, was in there. Yeah. You know, uh, schlogging the big, um, big lumber around and the big cement around. So these guys got into Expo. They chose the ones they wanted, and um, once they got in, they brought in the pieces and um, they they linked them up with the with the other artists that were there. And they had a lot of sculptures. So some of them were, uh, you know. Uh, some of them were disseminated um, in the city. There are still some of them around, like at, on Parc um, uh, Jean-Tapeau. There's some yeah. uh, at the old site. There's some 
that are broken down and and believe it or not there's still there's still a few that i know of in the city that are hidden away in mm -hmm. a, a small place and they're in total they're just like broken down uh robots and they're they're there but on the whole they did a pretty good job with all of yeah. them and now you're continuing carrying on the fun. i'm i'm largely influenced by expo because of the um um, the early um, Quebec, uh, early Quebec sculptors, I'm very influenced by, and I was lucky enough to know some of them, like Hans Schlee and uh, Stanley Lewis was a good friend of mine. He was a stone sculptor who I actually buried with uh, a couple other buddies um, after he died. Um, uh, Armand's still alive. Um, you know, Louis Archambault has a good good chunk out there at the in Ottawa, and uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Charles Daudelin mm -hmm. has some beautiful stuff at McGill and. You know, there's the um, Sophie Daou, and there's there's a beautiful yeah. array of uh, early sculptors from Quebec, and we're kind of um, we're we're kind of lucky because we don't um, iron sculpture basically started in 1945, yeah. and uh, after uh, Julio Gonzalez in Spain, like with David Smith and all these guys, and you know. Um, we're it's a, it's a relatively young medium, mm -hmm. so there's there's not so much um, you know like a, I mean, for a painter, they have all the heavyweights behind them, like, mm -hmm. you know, you know, Da Vinci and and yeah. all these these um, you know these these great painters. But in 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 steelwork, we don't really have this. So there's a beautiful explosion of new stuff coming out on the planet right now, all over the world, that is powerful, good, and uh, visually stimulating. On that beautiful note, thank you, Glenn, for being with You're us. Welcome.